would bring my grandmother, uh, who was Sarah Blanche Patterson before they married, over to her Patterson home place, which was located uh, just inside the Moore County line on Richmond Road, west of uh, Foxfire Village. And grandmother would tell me as a child how she used to see uh, trains go by the house, and she'd wave to them, and they'd be going down to the town of Craig Rooney. And it, it uh, had a bunch of stores that her grandfather, Jason Allman, owned, and her daddy was the depot agent there, she told me, and that there was one particular business that caught the imagination of a young boy. She told me the name of the hotel there was The Wild Pig. And you can imagine, you know, I mean, your imagination just kind of goes, what in the world would a hotel named The Wild Pig be like to stay in? And so I, you know, you know, you want to believe that your grandparents are telling you the truth, but I was looking at an empty field with cows in it and some cornfields, and I'm thinking to myself, how in the world could 60 years ago this have been a town, thriving or otherwise, out here where there's absolutely nothing left of it? And so my father predeceased my grandfather, and so the property passed from my grandfather directly to me. And on um, researching, you know, a little bit about the town, I started digging into it, and there was a real history to it and a lot of mystery to it. And the mystery starts with the name. I, I was wondering where in the world did this name Craig Roney come from? So I looked up Craig Roney and it turns out it's a Scottish town located on the River Clyde west of Glasgow. And is the sound? They can be turned up on the sure. Anyway, um, I, called up the, uh, I called up the Craig Roney Castle, which was located in um, that part of Scotland, and I spoke to the proprietor, and his name was Anthony Sherlock, and I said to him, could you tell me what does Craig Roney mean in Scottish? And he goes, oh, well, I'm not Craig Roney. Now there you go, now see, Craig, it comes from the Gaelic, it means crag or rock, and Roney, it comes from the Saxon word for ruin or red, so that could mean a red rock, or red crag, a rock that turns red, a rock with a rowan tree on it, or a hero with a rowan tree on it, take your pick. <laughs> so, I still don't know what Craig Roney means, but it means one of those five things, apparently. And so, I, um, and then the, where did it, you know, when was it named Craig Roney? Um, most documents say it was named by a man named W.B. Eckhout, who's going to figure fairly prominently in this story who came from Scotland with money from Scottish investors around the eight, early 1890s, comes to Aberdeen to want to get involved in the naval stores industry and has ideas about building a railroad, you know, getting involved with a, a, a business in Aberdeen that's already existing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But he had a, a fiance who couldn't make the trip with him. And she, her name was Eva Boyd. And his, her ship came into New York, and it was delayed because of a, of a quarantine, that there was uh, some sort of illness or plague going on, and so they made them stay for two weeks on board the ship until she could get off, and so then uh, WB Eckhout brought her here from New York, and you can imagine. Sam. Okay. You're talking to the one person who has that. No. <laughs> Yeah, so if I touch it, it will explode. <laughs> um, mechanical things that I, as you can tell. But anyway, okay, so, so Eva Boyd was allegedly from Craig Roney, Scotland, and he named it allegedly to make her feel less homesick, which, uh, you know, you can only judge how that work. They eventually get married, and uh, it doesn't end well. But um, they, uh, so W.B. Eckhout comes, and the, he was following a long line of Highland Scots who came here. The, it began after, I said, you know, the Battle of Culloden in 1746. The Highland Scots were defeated. The English and the Lowland Scots moved into the Highlands. They fenced up the land to graze sheep on it, which was just kind of destroyed the uh, free grazing that the uh, Highland Scots had had for their cattle. They broke up the clan system. Uh, there was really not a lot of, it was very lawless then in the Highlands. 
and a number of Scots left there and came to North Carolina, North Carolina being the number one colony for Highland Scots in North America, in America. And they came in through the port of Wilmington, and they moved up through the Cape Fear River Valley and its tributaries until they arrived in this area in the 1750s. And um, a lot of them uh, formed a community that was called the Ir Irgyle, Argyle community that was located where Moore, Richmond, and Montgomery County all joined on Drowning Creek was the Foxfire. And there were three brothers, my uh, great time seven grandfather, Duncan Patterson, and his brothers, Daniel and John. And they settled there, and um, I think it's time for me. There's the Craig Ernie Castle. And here is Craig Ernie. As you can see, this is Moore County before the little truncated part of Pope uh, was added to it. Here is Montgomery County, and here is Richmond County. Now it shows Craig Ernie in Montgomery County. But when it was chartered, Richmond County didn't want to miss an opportunity to tax people. So it carved out the 38 that was in Montgomery and made it part of Richmond. As soon as Craig Gurney failed, they politely gave it back to Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> so um, even then, politics was cut through. And you can see that there is a railroad that extends from Aberdeen through Roseland and Flynn on the Craig Roney, and I'll talk a little bit about that, the railroad, and how it gets there. The, um, the Highland Scots, who were living in the Argyle community, needed a Presbyterian church. They were all good Scottish Presbyterians, and so um, in 1819, a congregation was formed that eventually became the Jackson Springs Presbyterian Church, and uh, the elders were ordained in 1819, and my uh, ancestor Duncan Patterson, along with Kenneth Clark and Malcolm McCrumman and Hugh McDonald, were the original elders of the church. And an interesting fact was that there was a Patterson on the board at a session of the Jackson Springs Presbyterian Church until my cousin Jim Patterson passed away in 2000. So for nearly 200 years, the Patterson served on the session. Um, the this is Duncan. He came. He was born in 1750 and died in 1829. And here is his wife. He was married twice. His first wife passed away, as you can see, in 1800, Cornelia McNear, and that would be his my son's great grandmother. Here is no. This is his second wife, Sarah McLean. And then there's his son, Ed, who was born here in 1788. And this thing's close to my but that's okay. I talked pretty long. And he passes away in 1860. And this is his wife, Sarah, also. There seems to have been a lot of fondness for women named Sarah. I find about four of them in my ancestry. So, But I married a wonderful little. And these Pattersons are all buried in the Patterson Cemetery, which is located off of Jackson Springs Road between Hoffman Road and Jackson Springs Post Office, right across from any of you who know where Jim Patterson's house was. It's directly across the, the road back in the woods. Now this was the Patterson home place that was built during around the Civil War. And this was built by another Duncan Patterson. And the circle is the window that was the post office. And I'll talk a little bit about that. My, most of my ancestors, Duncan and John Edwards, were post sisters. And they used to deliver mail right out that one. The, uh, the, the people, uh, this, this particular house had additional buildings around it. There's a side view of it. There's the original kitchen that was always built because of the danger of fire. And there's the original smokehouse. These, all these still exist, and they're located just before, off of Richmond Road, just before Drowning Creek on the, on the left-hand side. Um, the, this area was famous for its naval stores industry. And naval stores, for those of you who don't know, 
are the products made from long leaf pine sap. The, the rosin, the pitch, the tar, and, and more especially the turpentine. And all these were integral parts of maintaining, building and maintaining wooden sailing ships and other things, turpentine being used in some medicinal products and, and also in building trades and things like that. And so there was a tremendous number of these naval store uh, businesses. And my great-great-grandfather, Jason Allman, came down from Randolph County back in the 1880s and settled. He built the first store in Norman, and he only had money to either build a store or a house. So he built the store and lived in a, law, in a uh, covered wagon behind it. And um, also the longleaf pine industry was big in this area. And there's the church at Jackson Springs. Uh, the uh, the longleaf pines were being cut down. They, large tracts of them were being bought up. And they were being bought up by lumber companies. Uh, in the Aberdeen area, there were several that were based out of there. And a number of log of... Um, the railroads that would go out into the woods, and a lot of them were trams that would pick up the, the logs, bring them back to the sawmills in Aberdeen where they'd be cut into lumber and shipped all over. Aberdeen was a depot on the Seaboard Railroad, and in one year alone, there were 50 million square feet of lumber shipped out of Aberdeen, making it the busiest depot on the Seaboard line. And so these, these industries, um, they needed to have lumber and the naval stores brought to the depot. And so they're, they're formed in the late 18, or in, in the, actually around 1890, a company called Tarbell Lumber Company was started in Aberdeen. And Tarbell Lumber Company was chartered in, and it had uh, board of directors was C.D. C. Tarbell, S.I. Moffat, Thomas Carlton, and L.D. Hazen. And they purchased several thousand acres of land south and west of Aberdeen for the timber and for the naval stores. And they needed a way to transport it. So in 1892, they formed Aberdeen Forwarding Company. And about that time is when W.B. Eckhout shows up. Uh, and W.B. had came over with money from nine Scottish and one English investor. And he becomes involved with Aberdeen Forwarding Company on the board of directors. And he says, I have a dream of building a railroad and starting a town. And he was thought to be, he was, he was described as a very pious man that was always on his way to visit a sick person that you'd see him on his way to there, and when you were leaving, he'd be on his way back. And he also had a lot of big dreams, and he's really the, kind of the motivating force behind the founding of Craig Grundy. And in 1893, he and the same board of directors of Aberdeen Forwarding found the Moore County Railroad, the MCRR. And the Moore County Railroad, there's my ancestor Duncan Patterson, and there's my other grandfather, John Edward, on the porch. And here are the naval stores. This is cat facing, is what they called it. For those of you not familiar with it, they would cat face the pine tree, and then they would have a bucket at the bottom of it to catch the sap, and that's what they'd use to make the naval stores with. And here is a locomotive from the Tarbell Company in Aberdeen. And then here's another locomotive. This picture we know for sure was taken at Craig Army. So that's one of the few pictures of something that was actually taken out there. Well, in 1893, W.B. Eckhout builds the railroad to the west, and the first stop along it is Roseland. And Roseland was developed by a man from Boston. He was a banker. His name was Clark Brown. And Clark Brown's going to kind of be the villain in this piece, if you will. Every good story has to have a snipery whiplash, and this is the one in this story. And he built a two story hotel in Roseland. And he had dreams of it being a competitor with the resort in Pinehurst. It was built around the same time and it was built and the railroad connected it to Aberdeen so that people coming from up north could get out to it 
and stay. And he had dreams of it being becoming a resort and you know investors building houses and uh, golf courses and a lot of big dreams. Now this Clark Brown had already had a bite out of the apple here with local investors. He had dreamed of building a railroad from Southern Pines to, to Fayetteville. And the description of the land after he started was it looked like a Civil War battlement. It was completely destroyed, torn up, and not one single rail was ever laid. And he leaves town owing people a lot of money and no return on their investment. But he has the hoods for to come back and start this Roseland and get more people to invest. He must have been really a slick talker because he got people to invest in this idea of uh, Roseland. So Eckhout builds the railroad to Roseland. Uh, the next year it continues on to Flynn and eventually in 1895 it ends up in Craig Rome. Now by that time my ancestor Jason Allman had a whiskey distillery, federally licensed by the way, um, <laughs> and a, a turpentine distillery and most people could tell the difference. Um, a cooperage, which is a place that they build barrels, a blacksmith shop, which is where they built the wire, the metal hoops for the barrels, a depot that my great grandfather John Edward Patterson was the depot agent, and eventually the post office moves from the Patterson house to Craig Roney. And here is a piece of stationery that was written on the Jackson Springs Hotel, eight, West End, 1890 blank. And in 1895, if you look on the back, you'll see a 30-acre piece that says Craig Roney. And W.B. Eckhout buys that 30 acres from a man named Alex Stewart. And if you'll notice across the top, it says a little branch, and the name of it is Polecat Branch. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be a little suspicious of whiskey made from a branch called Polecat. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was good, but you can see around there the McCrimmons, the Stewarts, these are all people whose names are still familiar in the area, and those were the neighbors to Craig Roney. So, the town starts to build up, and there are stores that are built. Um, there's a plat that's developed, and several of those I have here, and I'll share it with you later, uh, a deed that W.B. Eckhout sells 14 lots to Jason Allman. And a number of those on the bottom say Jason Allman on, and other investors and other people built businesses there. and it, got to be a, a fairly thriving uh, town. The post office there served a hundred people and there were um, there was in addition to the wild pig there was a, a general store, a second general store, a boarding house, the whiskey distillery, the post office, the depot and there as you can see there was also a brickworks and one of the products of it is that brick over there and they were distinctive because they were yellow the clay out there is yellow, not red, and so any of the bricks that were b built out there, and there was a brick kiln as well as a wood kiln, and so they were able to be fairly self-sufficient in making the things they needed in order to ship the products out of Craig Roney back to Aberdeen. The uh, post office was operated, and here is a letterhead of uh, my great great-grandfather Jason Allman, merchandise, you'll notice it says wines and liqueurs. And one of the drinks that was served in a bar out in Craig Roney, and of course they didn't allow whiskey to be served in the town because these are proper Scots people, so they had to have the bar off the site. So there was a nearby bar and there was a drink that was served called a possum persimmon toddy. It was said to be, by one of the people who partook of it, the finest drink they ever had. It consisted of a glass of persimmon beer with a shot of whiskey and a lot of sugar. Um, so um, you can judge for yourself whether that would be something you'd enjoy drinking or not. But apparently that was a big hit out in Craig Grumpy. Uh Some of the families that lived out there, you had, uh, in addition to the Almonds, the Markhams, and my ancestors, the Pattersons, the McKimmons, the Burroughs, and the Currys. And um, the stores uh, that were out there, um, 
were owned by uh, Mr. Uh, a man named Dan and Scott Blue had one of the stores. Uh, Jason Allman had another one. And the post office was run by a man named Malcolm or Mac Brown. And he ran it from the time it was moved out there in 1898 from Patterson Bridge till 1903 when Jason Allman took over as postmaster and eventually the post office was closed when Craig Rooney uh, went under and it was moved to Jackson Springs. Um, this is a picture of some of the barrels that were used in the industry. Here's a picture of a turpentine distillery where they would make the turpentine and here is a invitation to go visit the circus in Aberdeen. This was on October the 24th, 1895, and you can see the train left Craig Roney at 9 o'clock, stopped off at Deep Creek at 9.40, and returned from Aberdeen at 6 p.m. The fare was from Craig Roney 40 cents, and from Deep Creek 25. So you could spend the whole day at the circus in Aberdeen for the princely sum of 40 cents. And uh, the the records of the Moore County Railroad show that for several years it was extremely profitable. Um, shipping the turpentine and the products that were made to naval stores and the lumber, um, especially the lumber. And so in 1890, uh, here's the post office, Craig Roney, population 100, and in 1896, Clark Brown pops up again, and he's got this great idea. He's going to build the railroad, extend it from Craig Roney to Concord in Cabarrus County. And he somehow convinces the Cabarrus County commissioners that they should pony up $75,000 to help pay for this railroad. Well. Believe it or not, they're interested in it because they can get better freight rates for their products from Cabarrus County run on the seaboard coastline out of Aberdeen than they can the railroad that goes through Salisbury. So, but he gets the $75,000 with already, he's, you know, stolen God knows how much money for his railroad over here, but he gets that money and he gets additional funding and he creates the Moore County and Western Railroad, it was called. And once again, starts to make clear property for track, but doesn't lay a single rail. And this guy was good, I'm telling you. And uh, so the town <coughs> continued on, but unfortunately, this is what happens in situations where the, the people are only interested in the short-term gain and not, don't look out for the long-term interest of the community. As you can imagine, there are so many, only so many tall pine trees out there. And the, the naval stores industry is dependent on them standing to continue to make naval stores. The timber industry is interested in them falling so that they can be cut into lumber and shipped out of Aberdeen. So over the next 10 years, the people at Craig Roney managed to cut almost all of the available stands of the Longleaf Pond. Later on, in the early 1900s, uh, a school had been fashioned uh, at the depot, and Mrs. Curry, one of the Currys, had been the school mistress out there, and had taught people. And in 1915, they decide that they're going to build a school out there for the people in that part of North Carolina, the Derby area. So they build the Craig Rooney Fairview School. And um, a buddy of mine and I metal detect, and we were able to locate the site of the school uh, about a quarter of a mile uh, from Craig Rooney on a hill, which is a pretty fair view, and that was the name of it. And here is a picture of the students in front of it. And if you notice along the bottom, uh, about half the class are either Almonds or Pattersons. <laughs> so, and my great aunt Leyland Patterson is in that picture, and she actually becomes the head nurse at uh, Moore County Hospital, which is where I was born in 1949. And uh, she was a, a student there. 
So that remained with the Craig Ernie name attached to it. Eventually, the land is sold to my grandfather in uh, 1937. And this is a picture of Jason Allman. It's one of the few, Clyde Allman, his grandson, my cousin. Um, he was very happy and I had pictures of his grandfather. Uh, had quite a few of them, in fact. And I used to kid Clyde because he was a teetotaler. And I told him all that land that they sold to Seven Lakes was paid for with liquor money. And my grandfather buys Craig Roney in 1937 from the Myricks and the Gallimores on the courthouse steps in Troy for the princely sum of $150 for the 30 acres. And that's how it passes from my grandmother's side of the family to my grandfather's side of the family. The, uh, there's my grandparents. And here is my grandfather, my dad, B.A. Cox Jr. in the middle. And as I told you, every generation of Patterson has to have a Duncan. And that is that generation's Duncan Patterson, my uncle. So, the, um, what happened was in 1937, after my grandfather had purchased the land, he and my grandmother and my uncle Ralph, or excuse me, my uncle Robert Cox, were at Craig Roney, and a forest fire came over the ridge from Derby, headed toward Jackson Springs. My grandparents were able to get away in the car, and my uncle Robert remembers looking back and watching the fire destroy the few buildings that remained. They were just vacant and had been vacant for you know probably close to 30 years. But he watched. He said he saw the black smoke that would come up when it hit one of those pine buildings. And that destroyed the last vestige of Craig Roney. Uh, by the time I came along, all that was left were the foundation blocks. And I metal detected out there and found some interesting things, some musket balls, some Union Civil War mini balls, as there was a skirmish there toward the end of the Civil War. Uh, we also found some very interesting arrowhead, some dating from the archaic period, about 8,000 BC. So we know that area was inhabited long before the Scots got there. This was something we found out there that was an old iron, may have been used in one of the boarding houses or the hotel. This was a homemade ad that is laying over here, and you can see how it was made by a blacksmith in his shop. It certainly wasn't off a rack somewhere. There's a, one of the ties from the Moore County Railroad, and there's what was uh, the business end of getting those trees down, <laughs> those and saws. So those are some implements that were found. The last picture is the only known picture of of my family taken at Craig Roney. I've got other pictures taken at the home place, but that's my great grandfather, John Edward Patterson, and his wife, Dora Holman Patterson, and the little girl standing next to her is my grandmother. That was taken sometime around the turn of the century in front of one of the buildings. It's not the Wild Pig because it was a, a two story building. It may be one of the boarding houses out there because there were a couple of those. And that my friends, was the end of Craig Roney. And um, I've had the land for 20 years now. I've let it go back to the way it was before we showed up. And it's just woods now. And uh, the animals seem to pretty much like it that way. And uh, I don't mind it either. So thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you about Craig Roney. I hope I've you know, been instructive about how it got there. Thank you.